I always wanted to be a professional boxer. I didn't really know, know how to throw a right hand. I didn't know how to throw a hook. I learnt myself. Learned on the job. I learnt on the job. We we know how um, hard it is to, to become a professional. You boxed two world champions and you went the distance with them. And they offered me the fight. I said how much. All I want to know how much. At the time, I had a gambling problem. Uh, I need money. Got out the car. See this superstar, Glenn McCrory, on the other side of the ring. Yeah. I was I was supposed to be there just to make up the numbers. Uh, I ended up going eight rounds with him. A very very close fight. Uh, some of the people say I won it. Well, why am I pissing with blood? He said, it's George Carman just bit you through the neck. Explain what happened there, your fight with Johnny Nelson. Yeah. Well, tell us about your altercation you had at Wembley. I think, it, was it Wembley or was it a copper box you had with the Chris Eubank Senior? Tell us what happened there. My guest today is a tough, rough, English Romani Gypsy boxer. He has fought some of the world's leading fighters. I'm going to talk his journey through life and the two fascinating altercations he had with two of Britain's most famous household names. Welcome the granite chin Gypsy George Carmen. Hi George, welcome mate, nice to see you. George, you're born in Wisbeach, you're the youngest of seven. Tell me your earliest boxing memories. Well, I was the baby of the family. Uh... The earliest boxing memories, my dad come back one day and he said, I'll take his boxing. And uh, what was I was I think it was nine and a half year old, ten year old. And um, we used to always fight at home, me and my brother and my sister. And I went to this boxing gym, I thought it was a wrestling gym, didn't understand Your sister boxing. as well my used sister, to fight? Yeah, my sister as well. I was a tough girl then, so yeah. not a family to be messed with. <laughs> they, used to, they used to call us the three youngins. Uh, right. And there was me and my brother and my sister Diana. And we used to spar and we mess, mess about with pair of boxing gloves on. And my dad took us to the gym and I did this first spar. I weren't very good. I ended up getting a man on top of the head like a sledgehammer punch. Right. And used to, <laughs> they called me the sled, sledgehammer right. uh, in the gym. That was the first time I ever remember going boxing. Okay. I, did, I heard this fascinating story. I don't know if there's any truth in it. Your dad set up his own gym along with you and your brother who, who become a professional boxer. And there was something like four of you in this village in Norfolk, this sort of quite small gym, and, and three or four of you were champions from the same club as... That's correct, Joe. Uh, there was four of us in the gym in a place called Parson Drove. Uh, my dad, we, we used to go to a club in Wisbech, and we left that. Uh, my brother had become a schoolboy champion. Uh, there was a boy, young boy called David Smith come a schoolboy champion. And there was me, I got beat in the finals in Derby Assembly Halls. I become second best. So, so from the just a few small fighters, it's amazing. And your dad training you took you from a little village, we say in Norfolk, to the national finals. And three out of four fighters reached the final. Two were two champions. Yeah, we, we, had, like, we had. I think there was four boys in the gym. Three got to the finals. He had two champions. And I got beat in the finals. I got disqualified. Amazing actually. story. Yeah. What an achievement, though. Talk about um, you know uh, 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 just you know somebody punching above their weight as a gym. That's the ultimate story, isn't it? You know, yeah. you have all like, your reptons and your West Ham's and all that stuff, and your dad's come along from a sleepy little village in Norfolk, and three finalists. <laughs> when you talk about eight boys probably in the, in the village, and, yeah. three of them, and we had three of them <laughs> in the finals, so it Wonderful went story. You were professional at 18, um, as an heavyweight. I mean, you fought your career as a cruiserweight. Boxer, it showed you as a light heavyweight, which is totally, totally rubbish. Um, you box mostly as cruiser, but as some heavy. But your turn pro is amazing. As a baby at 18 year old, you're out your body fully grown, and you're allowed to turn pro as an heavyweight. I mean, that was in the deep end, putting it mildly, was it not? Yeah, I stepped in the deep end, Joe. Uh, I was a young man. I first went to the professional gym at 17, and I went to Andy Smith's gym. After that, at 18, I went back to Norwich. I went to Gordon Holmes in Norwich. Uh, I always wanted to be a professional boxer. Uh, it was in me. I had. I think it was 110 amateur fights yeah. and one senior fight. Yeah. And I ended up turning pro at 18 with Gordon Holmes. Uh, I fought at every weight. I won my first few fights and quite enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, not surprising, but were you, were you again, just like your dad's club before you in that village, the, the signs are clear here, you're punching above your weight in every sense because you, you wasn't, clearly wasn't a developed heavyweight in the sense of uh, mental maturity and physical maturity, but you boxed early as an heavyweight and done well. 
And that's amazing, really. That's just underlining the tough man that you become from an early age, isn't it, really? Well, I, I, I learned on my feet as a, as a boxer, Joe. I was, uh, when I started fighting, uh, I didn't really know, even know how to throw a right hand. I didn't know how to throw a hook. I learned myself. Learned on the job. I learned on the job. I, I all I knew, I had to punch the bag. I had to keep that bag, keep going for three minutes. Yeah. And that's how I, that's how I fought. Didn't know what eating the right food was. Uh, I remember once I, I went down. I was living in Wisbech. I had to get from Wisbech to Norwich to go training. I had five pound. It cost me three fifty in the tank, and I probably bet the other one fifty on the way back. <laughs> I think the second fight I got three hundred and eighty-eight quid. I never forget that three hundred eighty-eight quid. The life and times of a lad that wants to be a champion boxer, right? Yeah. yeah, Joe. Uh, the three hundred eighty-eight quid. Uh, when I got it, I never. The reason why I never forget the three hundred eighty-eight quid. I moved from Wisbech to Norwich, and we pulled on a field uh, where we used to do some work, and we used to stop around the fields at end days. Yeah. And we went out for a night out after I fought, yeah. me and the wife and some friends, and I hid the three hundred and fifty pound in a kettle. Yeah. And I went out, I spent probably 10 or 15 quid. We come back the next morning, the wife made me a cup of tea. <laughs> and I said, Bought me, make me a cup of tea. She boiled the kettle, and so my money was in the kettle. She boiled me money. Yeah. I was going to kill her because she boiled me money. <laughs> and that's why I never forget the free of the eight quid. I think Costa Coffee is expensive. That was an expensive cup of tea, wasn't it? That was true, Joe. <laughs> But that's the life of boxing. Brilliant. You boxed two world champions and you went the distance with them, you know, and we, we know how um, hard it is to, to become a professional, but the box over the duration to go the full distance of two world champions, one of them being um, the famous the British fighter um, from Newcastle, Glenn McCrory. Tell us about that fight. Yeah, Joe, Glenn McCrory, uh, he was on beat at the time. I think he was, I'd say, 15 and 0. I'd probably had three fights, I think I was three and oh, and, or might have been three and one, I can't remember. And they offered me the fight, I said how much, all I want to know how much, at the time I had a gambling problem, uh, I needed money, they probably offered me 1200 quid, 1100 quid, it yeah. was a lot of money in them days, that's 20% for me uh, trainer and manager. And I went down, jumped in the car, went to Newcastle, uh, after four hours driving, got out of the car, see this Superstar Glenn McCrory on the other side of the ring. Yeah. I was I was supposed to be there just to make up the numbers. Uh, I ended up going eight rounds with him. A very, very close fight. Uh, some of the people say I won it, but probably I might have done better if I would have been trained right. That night, I signed 300 autographs. Really? Uh, lady from Newcastle, she wanted to manage me. She said, I said, now I've got my own manager. Brilliant, right. brilliant story. And in fact, one of my mates from London was um, a good friend with Tony McCory, Johnny Fagan, my, my, my cousin, the late Johnny Fagan. Um, his good mate with Tony McCory, Glenn's uncle, and he was at that fight. He was incidentally supporting Glenn because of his uncle, who was based in Hounslow. And um, he actually thought you, you nicked at least a draw of that fight. He said it was a cracking fight. Yeah, Joe, if, when you're on your own show, uh, you box them up in Newcastle, you've got to knock them out to win. Uh, it was a very close fight. I think I lost by one round. Uh, but look, the best man won on the night because he turned out to be a world champion. Oh, that's you know? brilliant. Well, that's um, no cell grapes there. But and you, I said, did you ever stay in touch with Glenn from time to time? I met Glenn obviously on on the on the different shows. But he come down to my uh, gym uh, about four years back yeah. and Glenn come in the ring to do a documentary on me and my son. And he wouldn't have forgotten you then would he having given him a tough night's work at Gateshead? No he knew me and we had a good time we got in the ring together. Did you? Uh, <laughs> yeah we got in the ring together and we had a stare off. Oh uh, right. For, for Sky Television. Yeah yeah. And I said go on Glenn for old times let's get the gloves on and he didn't fancy it. Oh right. <laughs> but, I mean, neither would I if um, he, had a, he had that tough a night's work. So the, the second world champion that you had fought was Johnny Nelson. I was in Liverpool watching the Open Championship golf and Johnny Nelson um, and Tony Bellew was there. We met Tony during the day, but Johnny and Adam Smith, we kind of had a drink together. Lovely fella, John and Nelson, uh, Johnny Nelson, really nice fella, as was Adam Smith. But we got chatting away, so I said, um, did you not fight the um, famous gypsy fighter, Georgie Carmen? He went, yeah, he said, Brendan Ingle said to me, yeah, we're fighting a gypsy lad next Thursday, whatever the day was. And he went, um, yeah, come back first round. How are we doing? He said, well, not too bad. He said, um, 
Brendan said, fine. He said, well, then why am I pissing with blood? He said, because George Carman just bit you through the neck. Explain what happened there, your fight with Johnny Nelson. Yeah. When, why did you bite him? Well, Johnny Nelson, I boxed him in the Grosvenor House Hotel. I remember, just like yesterday. Uh, very awkward fella. Yeah. Uh, he was like elastic. And uh, I went in the first round. I was a fast starter. Uh, very awkward to lay glove on John. Didn't throw a lot of shots, but he was very awkward to throw a glove on. So I thought to hold him still. I put my chin on his shoulder and just chewed him a couple of times and tried mm. to get a couple of his body. <laughs> that's, that's boxing with you know. I take it you like your steak rare, at least. Not well done. Yeah, bo boxing's boxing, and yeah. uh, you learn every little trick in the book, don't you? You know, I learned the how by myself. Uh, I got it done to me. Yeah. Sparring in the gym, so. Yeah, so so you went the full distance, and he became a legendary figure. I think he held the world title for something like seven years, a WBO champion for seven years, cruiserweight champion, and, and for much of his career in every way, one of Britain's most accomplished fighters, when you look at it that way, for the length of time he had his title. And to go the full distance with him, you know, you make no bones about it, that's a bit of an achievement. But how did the fight go? Did, did, you know, is it a comfortable enough journey, although you lost on points? Good fight. Uh, I was there to win it, not to lose it. Uh, it was a very close fight. I think he just nicked me on the night. Yeah. Uh, the better man won on the night, and obviously he went on and done better things. But yeah, I enjoyed it. Uh, Good. I did on many of my fights, yeah. but he could punch. Very, nice fella. Punch you, you met John? Yeah, John, I met John. He, yeah. No, no other times he's been down to my gym. Uh, yeah. Very gentleman, Lovely gentleman man, sportsman. Yeah. Good. Good at his job. Very good at man. You challenged for five professional titles, unfortunately without success. But you did fight uh, Lou Gent, um, the same Lou Gent who fought Nigel Benn in that great world title fight. And many believe that you beat Lou Gent that night for the British Southern Area title. Um, and uh, in fact, I've, I've seen some paper clips to say that they thought you won it. Just touch on that one. Did you think you'd beaten Lou? Yeah, I went up and I think it was uh, Battersea Ledger Centre or Brentwood Ledger Centre, one of the Ledger Centres. Uh, obviously got a fight with Ujent for the Southern Area title. Uh, unfortunately, my biggest problem was making the scales. It was making the weight because I was always it to lose a lot of weight to get to the yeah. get to the weight. I trained pretty hard for the fight, didn't train as I should have done. Ten rounds, ten hard rounds, uh, good fight, close fight. I thought I edged it and so did everybody else in the hall, but obviously the referee went the opposite way. Uh, good fight. Lou Gent was a gutsy fighter, but he was something like myself. He was fighting out his weight class. Yeah. He went to cruiserweight, he was super middleweight. Uh, I was a, probably a super middleweight. I used to fight a cruiserweight in every weight. I trained probably four days to get to the weight instead of for the fight. It was night, uh, Lou Gent had probably one of the best fights I'd ever seen in Britain, although that only lasted four or five rounds with um, Nigel Benn. Um, a great four round, very gutsy performance by a gent. I, I, it's one of my favourite fights to watch. I recommend anybody who ain't seen it to um, go on YouTube and grab the uh, Nigel Ben v Louis Gent. So, so you're really mixing in some serious class. But whilst we're talking about the legendary Nigel Ben, tell me, did you not have an altercation um, with Nigel Ben out the ring over a dispute of top in the Ville or Saint? Was that true? That's true. Uh, I was down in Norwich. Nigel Ben was on a couple of my undercards. Uh, I boxed Tommy Taylor up in Wisbech and he knocked out the quickest knockout ever, I think, on Wisbech Sports Centre. But we was fighting down in Norwich. I was fighting Andy Strong for the British title. Eliminate for the British title, sorry. Yeah. And uh, Andy Strong didn't turn up for the weigh-in. And I was, you know, I was a bit upset because I weren't fighting Andy Strong for the weigh-in. And then he said, he come on the scales, and he started deaf and blind to me. So I jumped on top of him. And we had a little rough and tumble. Oh, right. Well, that's fair as boxing guys. <laughs> and, and it got split up. Yeah, it got split up, okay. yeah. Well, when I, when I mention Nigel Benn, it's, it's probably only fair that you think of Chris Eubank. Um, and tell us about your altercation you had at Wembley. I think, it, was it Wembley or was it the Copper Box you had with the Chris Eubank Senior? Tell us what happened there. Yeah, well, what happened after we had that with Nigel Benn on the night, uh, I've become a friend of Nigel Benn, but on that night, I, I actually got the best fight of the night, so I rubbed it in Nigel Ben's face. Right. Uh, it was the second out program, yeah. and it was a cup full of fivers. They 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 bought a, a substitute in for me. It was yeah. Supposed to be a no good light every weight. Apparently, he was number ten in the world. Blaine Longston. Right. Okay. A very very good fighter. Yeah. And I got beat on a very close fight. I got a bad cut in the eighth round. Yeah. And got beat in a close fight. But as far as me and Chris Eubanks goes, I first met Chris Eubanks. Uh, in Brighton, I went down to sparring, he was getting ready for a world title. Yeah. And they wanted a heavier fight to come in and sparring. 
and I handled him pretty easy. I was bigger than him. Obviously, I could lay on him. And then I, I ended up meeting Chris Eubanks again. Uh, the second time I spied him in Romford, uh, he was fighting for another world title. Yeah. And he got out of the ring then me. He wouldn't spar me because I was a self-potter, but I was getting the better of him. Don't get me wrong, Chris Eubanks was a great fighter. Yeah. Superstar. And his super middleweight, he'd done the best he ever could. I wished I could have got super middleweight. Yeah. But I never did train right. But his time went on and life went by. Uh, I, I lost my way in, in life. Uh, I, become a, I was a Christian, a preacher, and I lost my way. And I, I went back into the world, and I went to a boxing show one day. And Chris Eubanks walked in there, and I'm laid there, I sat there, sorry. And I said, all right, Chris, who are you, he said. And he seemed like he didn't want to talk to me. I said, Chris, you must remember me, I inspired you. Never did, he said. And he walked away from me, quite ignorant to me. All right. And I walked over to him, I said, Chris, I said, you remember the time you, you got out of the ring again, me? And you said you knocked out El Graham in Spiral. Right? No, he said, I can't remember. And just as that happened, El Graham walked up to me. Yeah. And I tell El Graham, yeah. and El Graham had a go at him. Yeah. So the next day he's come back in because it was the Box Cup, I'll never forget it, in I think it was Alexander Palace. Yeah. And he's bought his son, or his two sons, he bought his bodyguard and about four others. Yeah. So I'm in there, there's two other travellers in there. And this bloke this kept eyeing me up and kept looking at me, kept staring me out across this hall. And this kid came up to me and said, look, Uncle George, he said, I'm on your side, he said. If he comes over, I'll draw the box. I said, no, I said, don't worry, just let me see, just see fair play for me. And Chris's bodyguard walked across the hall and he's put his face in my face. He said, what I want to tell you, I've got him by the back of his trails, he's thinking, I'm running across the hall, kicked in the ass, and tell Chris Eubanks, you're no good either. He's all I want to say, Chris Eubanks said he respects you. Oh, right. <laughs> I jumped the gun too quick, so I'm wrong. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> that's, that's life. Well, what I can say is you, you've only wanted to be noted as a boxer. I've, I've known you for a long time, and you're a gentleman outside of boxing. Um, and you're not really, you know, you never really wanted to be known as a knuckle fighter, but I do know the knuckle fights you have had, you've done good in, and whilst uh, you haven't pushed for them, they've come your way. I know you're very, very strong. A rest, I've seen you wrestling some of your fighters that you've previously trained on the floor, even past your sell by date. You're a very strong man in presence. Um, I don't think you, Bank and Ben, would have had it all their own way. Trust me, as, as good as they were. They, we would never know the outcome, but uh, they wouldn't have had it all their own way, George, in my opinion. <laughs> well, they was good fighters. Yeah, they were great. Oh, perhaps they had a good wrestling. They were great fighters, yeah, yeah, yeah but I mean, fighters. the street fights on a boxing match, although you're all, you know, they were great boxers and you were very good. One of the stories I've heard, and I've just heard it recently, I'm not too much up on it, um, but I love it. The, I think he's the third, third youngest heavyweight champion of the world, Herbie Ide, who, who was from Norwich, your type of roots originally, whilst you had a lot of settlement in West London. Um, is it true he used to come down to your gypsy encampment on the field and spar with you with, with hardly any pad in the gloves, Herbie Ide? Is that true? Well, that's true. Uh, I used to come from Norwich, I was based out in Norwich. Uh, I boxed a couple of Norwich kids, uh, Richard Boston beat him, Dave Lawrence beat him, and then Herbie I come along and he was a new kid on the block. Right. And obviously I, I always wanted to try myself out about the best and obviously he he come down to spar me. He he rung me up, he said, Can I spar you? I said, Of course you can. And he biked down on his bike, he was about seventeen, right. sixteen or seventeen, I don't know. I was a young pro. And he got on the field and we, we got a pair of gloves on, or I think one of us had a pair of pads on. Yeah. And we had a spar for six, seven rounds. And most days he'd bike up there and do it. Really? And but that's nearly kid. a knuckle fight, John. But yeah, but I mean, he is tough, but you need to be tough. I mean, this man developed young. He, he was he was a superstar. He lost to the legendary Riddick Bowe. And Bowe just outstrengthed him because he's quite a small heavyweight um, idol. Brilliant speed. I mean, he's, he's one of the youngest heavyweight champions ever. So you're saying he's a tough lad at, uh, what, 17, 18? And you were, what, 19, 20? Yeah, he's only a young kid. But you had to be tough as well, though. I mean, but you weren't exactly an old seasoned, developed fighter yourself, eh? No, but I had a big ring. It was outside. <laughs> <laughs> you bought and needed it against them, but no, that's a lovely story. And um, after all your, your fighting achievements yourself, um, tell me what it meant to you when your son, George Carman Jr., George Michael Carman, um, become the world um, under WBC World Under 25 double weight champion, and seeing your son as a professional what did that mean to you and your dad, respectively, and the family? At the time, it was the best time of my life when he won the title, because he'd done something I didn't do, 
Uh, always wanted to win a, fight, a title. Yeah. Tried my best. Uh, it at my time. Uh, but never won a title. But when he won a title, it meant a lot to me. You know, just to see him win a title. But now, thank God, he's, he's out the game. And he lives a good, clean life. And that's the most important thing. And it takes a good man to get in the ring. So it doesn't matter how good you do or how bad you do. As long as you get in the ring and have a go. It takes a good man to get in that ring. Absolutely, yeah. I, I was at that fight. And the, the touching moment for me, um, believe it or not, wasn't George... Uh, junior, your son, or yourself. It was actually your dad, um, who I had the pleasure of knowing. God bless him, God bless his soul. Yeah. A lovely man. Um, I had the pleasure of knowing, and I saw from the sidelines, the, you know, the tears and the emotion. And uh, I almost got emotional, you know, witnessing it. So, so it was a family affair. I must have, uh, it, was, it was a really nice night. Yeah, it was a very good night, Joe. And uh, I had a lot of pressure that day, because uh, it was his second title fight. The first one was, that was a dream. Uh, but he said, I want to be a two-weight world champion, Dad, youth world champion. So I thought, right, we'll do it. He come back off his honeymoon, and he come back at 12 stone, and he had to be 10 stone. And we got the weight wrong. What's the work to be done there? Uh, the night before the fight, he was a stone overweight. So we took a stone off him overnight, which we shouldn't have done. Uh, we got to the scales. We made the scales. That's all we did do. And when he walked into the ring, he was bad as a dog. And he's got to do 10 rounds. I arranged the fight, I'm the promoter, I put all my money in the show, I've, I'm looking, my boy ain't himself, if you pull him out, we've got to pull the show, it costs us every penny we've got, uh, I'm taking my boy to the ring, really, for slaughter, because I, I took a stone off him overnight, yeah. he's been sick before he went in there, and we walk into the ring, I've got raised gloves on, and the boy's had eight fights, knocked out seven, yeah. so how do I feel? Yeah. And we go in the first round, and he takes, I think it was seven or eight stitches. It was a nasty cut, because I was at the fight. It was a nasty cut in round one, wasn't it? I think he ended up with about 17 stitches. Yeah, he had two bad cuts. I think it was Jim Evans doing yeah, Jim the cuts. Yeah, Jim Evans did a great, great cut. cut I, couldn't, I couldn't see. I, I, I was at ringside with my dad, bless him, and, and my dad um, loved that fight. And he said uh, we couldn't believe how he got through, how, how Jim had stemmed the flow of the blood to get through. But anyway, moral of the story... Um, it was, it was just almost a time of your life winning those titles. Yeah. Whilst you admit time. your preparation it was great best, for that one. It was the best time of life. And, uh, you know, it was a dream come true for me. Yeah. And to see me boy become a two-way world champion. Good stuff. It was a dream come true. And know. he's happy now, more importantly. He's happy. And the rest of my life now, you know, are, they're memories for life. You can't buy the memories. So, having had this long... Um, having had this long... What you can only describe as a roller coaster career. I mean, I'd, I'd seen you... Um, mm. Big Southern Area champion uh, Paul McCarthy. So I'd seen I'd seen you. I mean, among many, I've seen you beat champions and stuff. So it's, it was up and down. You've had some close decisions against world champions, etc., etc. Um, you you said you've travelled and come in at late notice and fought out of weights, etc. Uh, even as an heavyweight, as a young boy. But through your career, who's the best fighter you've ever met? I he somebody that's hit you on the chin in the spa. Somebody who's made it basically in a ring. Who's the best fighter um, you've ever met? Best fighter I ever met. It's probably many different ways. Obviously, I sparred Frank Bruno. So Frank Bruno was the hardest puncher I thought. He busted really? me John. Yeah, he busted me Frank. Yeah, sparred Frank well, Bruno. He was a, good spar. He could hit heavy, couldn't he? One, yeah, very, very heavy puncher. But one of the quickest fighters I thought was a boy called Eddie Smarders out in Harlem. Uh, yeah. I signed out myself out of hospital. I had an, had an operation on my hand. I had some broken knuckles and that in my hand. And I signed myself out. Jim Evans wrong up and said, Do you want to fight? In four days' time. I said, Yeah, I'll take it. And I flew over to Harlem to fight a man called Eddie Smiley. I think he's world kickboxing champion, yeah. European champion. And uh, over there, they had men and women boxing on the same bill. And I was waiting for my fight. And this bird got in the ring. It was his sister. All right. And she knocked a bird. This I've worn out in about 30 seconds. I thought she could beat me. It was like a lamb going to slaughter. A lamb going to slaughter. I got chopped the bits for eight rounds. Did you? Yeah. yeah well, was it going eight rounds? It was the best fight he ever met, pound for pound. Eddie? Eddie Smarties. Uh, the European very, champion. Very, very, yeah. very quick fight. Between I'm not saying he was the best, but he was the fastest I ever fought. I mean, probably the toughest. He'd give you the most difficult night. Yeah, because yeah. with me with boxing, I didn't mind how hard I got hit. I didn't mind one punch, because I would take it, but when somebody kept hitting you with loads of punches, it hurt. Yeah. <laughs> um, over this career, any regrets? No regrets at all. Two, if two regrets, I should say. I wished I'd have trained for a, for the fight, not the weight, and I'd have been super middleweight and fought Chris Eubanks. 
Yeah, in the ring. In the ring. Not, not in the ring. Yeah, yeah. So you had to almost uh, nearly had it out the ring. Yeah, and with Nigel Ben. So, um, uh, so how is things post post boxing now for you? It's a very difficult thing to walk away from those big heightened fights. Say, for example, you you signed three hundred autographs against Glenn McCrory, You know, in a very close fight, the place was packed out, no doubt. He was a local fighter. Walking away from all that, what do you do these days? T tell me, are you happy and content? Uh, what, what do you do these days with yourself? I'm in the best place of my life at the moment. Uh, when, I, when I walked away from boxing, I, I always said when I packed in boxing, I'd never make a comeback. And my last fight was sort of the Commonwealth title again, Chris Oko, yeah. Babylon Jammer. And I only got, I think it was three days notice to fight for that. Yeah. So I trained for the weight, uh, got to the scales, I was still two or three pound over. Spooked me got so after I ate something to eat, I was in a bad state. Got to the scales, got to the fight the next day, come round to myself after seven rounds I blew up. And I packed in and I promised God I'd pack in. And I packed in boxing. After time I'd become a preacher and I had a very, very good life. I had everything going for me. Uh, life was good, life was sweet. Uh, but I took my eyes off of God, put my eyes back on the world. And before I knew I was gambling again, and I walked away from God and destroyed my life. And I went through a lot. I mean, I ended up in a very, very bad, lonely, dark place. But I thank God six years ago, or seven years ago, I mean now, I'll give my life back to Jesus. It ain't been easy. Since then, I had kidney cancer. Thank God I'm healed of cancer. Uh, my wife had cancer, she's healed of cancer. I've had car accidents, but today I'm fighting fit for Jesus. I fight. I fight for the Lord now, winning souls for Jesus. I thank God I've got a good business. I thank God the Lord's providing every day, spiritually, financially, and spiritually. And all I want to do is tell someone to love of Jesus and live a good, clean, happy life. Good. Well, that sounds great. The most George, thing. I have this saying, um, I say to people, uh, I might be a big, strong old boy, which I maybe have been a little bit in my time, but I say I'm not big enough and strong enough to take on the good Lord. So it's, it's uh, nice to know that uh, you're a, bro a brother, believing in a good man himself. And um, I don't think we can take him on. We ain't big enough between us, are we? No way. We've got to go with no him, haven't we? Not by might, not by power, by the Spirit, says the Lord. Yeah. And finally, what message are you going to give to the young boxers and the young people out there before we leave? We'll, we'll just give them a quick message. What is it? If you're going to take up boxing, be 110% dedication. Get yourself a good trainer and a good manager. If you're a professional, make sure you get yourself a good trainer. Yeah. Because your trainer becomes your second dad. And trust in him. You have to trust in your trainer. Believe in 100%. You know, if you doubt your trainer, get yourself a new trainer. Trust in your trainer. Train hard. No, no, we all won't be champions, but it's a good journey. Keep there you safe. go. So there's the message. Look out. It's been a pleasure having Gypsy George Carmen. George, I'm pleasure to... Um, I've had this chat today with you and we've shared a ring, we've done a little bit together, it's been an absolute pleasure, one of, one of boxing's gentlemen's. So there you go, don't forget to click and subscribe and you'll come on some more of these legends in the future. Bye for now.